Hello, dear viewer. This is the seventh chapter of a wonderful, or maybe not, story under the general title, Caught Her Cheating. So if you haven't watched the other parts, then be sure to look in the description. And if you have already seen it, then pour yourself a hot cup of tea and have a nice viewing. A New Beginning in Key West Chapter 7 the disclaimer about the judicial system and law enforcement remains in place. Cleveland is still making love. I caught her cheating part too. What happens now? I walked out of the restaurant onto the street. The cab was just dropping off passengers when I heard her behind me. Matt. Matt. Please, Matt. Listen to me. I jumped into the empty cab before she could catch up with me. Where to, Mac? Just drive up the street. We drove a few blocks before I told him to stop. I gave him a 20 and got out. It was about 8.30 and I walked. My cell phone rang. It was Julie. I answered it. Has it only been five times? Matt, no, please. I didn't need to hear anything else. I turned my phone off. Did you sleep with him? I asked her years ago. No. Oh, God, no, she said. Matt, God is my witness, she said. I swear by all the saints I never had sex with him, she said. God won't be happy with her, I thought. I was still out walking at three in the morning, and I was exhausted, but I felt no desire to go back to the apartment. I looked around and saw that I was on Broadway. The last time I was there, Julie and I had taken my mom and Les to see Mama Mia. She wanted to see Jersey Boys, but I told her their vocabulary might be too crude. Walking and thinking all night long, I came to one conclusion. We need to get out of New York. These women must have a special way of saying they can cheat on me. I was going to take my car, load the things from the apartment that I considered important into it, and drive out of town. It was early Sunday morning, and I assumed Julie would be home, so I couldn't pick up my stuff today. But I knew she had an urgent project she was working on, so she needed to be at work on Monday. Times, Square is awake 24 by 7, so finding a hotel wasn't a problem. I put a do not disturb sign on the door and went to bed. I had already resigned myself to the fact that I would have to leave Julie and New York, so it was relatively easy to fall asleep. I woke up early in the afternoon and went outside to eat. I turned my phone back on. There were a dozen more calls and nine more messages from Julie. I deleted them all and for the second time since I'd gotten to know her, blocked and deleted her number. I took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. I didn't feel like complete shit. Monday morning, I walked through the front door of our house. One of my favorite doormen was on duty. We said hello like old friends. Harry, I said. I know she asked you to call her if I came over, didn't she? Yes, Mr. Matt, she did. I want you to do me a favor. What's that, Mr. Matt? Give me two hours before you call her. I handed him $200 bills. You don't have to do that, Mr. Matt. How about I give you an hour? He glanced at his watch. He never took money. It took me an hour and five minutes to gather my important things, mostly papers, manuscripts, bank and investment documents, some clothes, and put them in the car. I also took what we called our vacation stash. It was $10,000, and we were saving it to use in case we needed cash. I sat in my car and pushed the button to open the garage door and drive away. A police car drove down the street and stopped in front of the building. Julia jumped out of the car before it came to a complete stop and ran up to the door. She seemed to be making a habit of showing up in law enforcement cars just as I was leaving. The first time it was a state police car, and now this. I drove past the building and peeked inside to see her talking to Harry. The trip to Key West went without incident. Knowing that she had the full resources of the NYPD to help her, I never used our credit cards during the trip in case she tried to track my movements with checks and credit cards. Five days after arriving in Key West, I signed a three-month lease on a very nice apartment. The owners rented it out when they were at their home in Michigan. I had been in the apartment for a week when Sylvia, my editor, called. Where are you, Matt? Not in New York. I know that. Julia's been trying to find you. I figured as much. But you're not going to tell her, are you? Of course not, but... No, but Sylvia, if you tell her, I swear I'll find a new editor and publisher. Oh, okay. But it's a moot point, because I don't know where you are anyway. That's right. So, wherever you are, are you having fun? Absolutely. 
These mountains are gorgeous. I have no idea if she fell for that one. I don't doubt it. Look, Matt, you know you still have a book to write, right? Working on it might take your mind off your problems. I don't have any problems. She laughed. How many new friends have you met there? And how many evenings do you spend hanging out to have fun? Don't tell me you don't have any problems, Buster. Of course she was right. I was in a severe moping mood and decided to get rid of it, even if it killed me. Later that day, I went to the grocery store. There were two newspaper stands in front of the entrance. One was the local paper, the other was a national paper that dealt only with scoops. On the front page of this piece of crap paper was a picture of Gordon Willis with a huge grin on his face. The article detailed how he had taken advantage of at least 20 women and made a fortune from it. Two more than the 18 I had heard of before. He talked freely about how he chose his victims and how he managed to deprive them of money because once he made love to them, they liked it so much they would do anything he asked. That was enough for me. I couldn't finish reading it. This article was most likely the result of a conversation I overheard in the restaurant the night I found out Julia had slept with him. One way or another, he would pay some day. It would have been so easy to get discouraged again when I saw that paper, but I resisted. I forced myself to go out and meet people. I forced myself to go out at night to dances and parties, and it worked. After a few days, I was almost back to my old self, and a phone call made it better. Hey, Freddy. How are you doing, Mr. World Famous Writer? <laughs> Not too bad. What's wrong? We were talking to Ken and Maya, and we were wondering what you thought of the weekend in Key West. When would you be able to make it? What do you mean? Are you there? Uh-huh. How long are you going to be there? Maybe for the rest of my life. How did you convince Julia to move there? I didn't. She convinced me. What do you mean? Does the word cheat mean anything to you? Of course it does. It means, oh no, Matt, uh, you or her? Her. I'm sorry. Yeah, of course you are. So when do you think you'll be here? In two weeks. That's great. You guys can stay at my place. There's plenty of room. We talked some more before hanging up. Half an hour later, my phone rang again. It was Ken, and I had to tell the story again. The weekend I spent with them was fantastic, just like any other time I spent with them. It was different this time because we were all in the same living space instead of in separate hotel rooms. We all immediately felt comfortable in this environment and enjoyed being together. After sympathizing with Julie and I for about an hour, we headed to the beach, and Julie wasn't mentioned again all weekend. The condo had three bedrooms and two baths. They shared the second bath. After a day at the beach, we went back to the condo. I started grilling steaks on the grill, and the others went to change. I had already opened a package of steaks and sprinkled them with sea salt and pepper, getting ready to grill them when Michelle came out. Can I use your shower? Ken and Maya are in ours, and I can hear them having fun in there, so they can keep it occupied for a while. Sure, just leave me some hot water. She went to their bedroom and came back with a towel and her hair supplies and then went into my bedroom. After a couple minutes, she called out to me. Matt, come in here, please. She stood in the bathroom completely unclothed. There was water running in the large tub. I stopped and stared at her. She started to say something, but stopped when she saw the look on my face. She started laughing. What's the matter with you? You've seen me like this before. That was years ago, and it was only up to my waist but I like this better. She laughed again and splashed water in my direction. Pervy, how do you turn on the shower on that thing? I leaned over and showed her where the button was that switched the water from the faucet to the shower. That's the dumbest place for it, she said, stepping into the spray. I stood there for a few seconds and watched as she reached for the soap. I stepped out and closed the door behind me. For a lady who, before meeting Ken, Maya and Matt had never been undressed by anyone but her husband, and no man other than her husband and the doctor had ever seen her breasts, allowing me to see her completely naked was something. But I didn't mind. The rest of the weekend went as expected. Lots of banter and wine, but mostly just friends being with friends and enjoying it. Besides grilling steaks, Michelle and Maya took over the kitchen while Freddie and Ken did the cleaning. Aside from seeing Michelle with no clothes on, I enjoyed it. They all left Sunday night with hugs, kisses, and handshakes. Just like the night she was in front of me without her outerwear, when Michelle hugged me goodbye, I felt an even stronger hug. 
and instead of a kiss on the cheek, she gave me a quick peck on the lips and then a wink. After they left, the apartment felt very lonely. After wandering around for about an hour, I sat down at my computer and started writing. I was working on outlines for my next book. Two weeks after my friends left, I got a call from Sylvia. Matt, Mr. Meigs would like you to fly down here for a meeting. He's interested in your plan for the new book and wants to chat about the new contract. When can you make it? Maybe next week. I can send you an outline so you can look at it before I get here. No, that's all right. Take it with you. The following Monday, I flew to New York. I checked into the hotel, freshened up, and went to see Sylvia and Justin Meigs. The meeting lasted a couple hours, and Sylvia offered to buy me dinner. I agreed. After all, they had made a lot of money off me. Sylvia was waiting for me outside the steakhouse, I suggested. It was considered one of the best and most expensive in the country. I opened the door for Sylvia, and she walked in. I looked around and saw only one empty table. Next to the empty table was another table with only one other person sitting at it. She was sitting with her back to us, but she turned to the waiter and I saw it was Julie. I looked at Sylvia, who was looking at me nervously. Was this your idea? Or hers? Matt, we just thought, no, it wasn't. You didn't think. I turned and walked out. She followed me out. Matt, you need to talk to her. She's got something important. No. What I need is a new editor. It's over between us. I knew she and Julie had become friends, but I didn't realize they were that close. I went back to my hotel and was seething with anger. Two women cheating on me, and two different women betraying me. What the hell is this? The next morning I called Justin Meigs. Sylvia had already told me, he said. I informed her that we're a publishing house, not a marriage counseling service. There was a short pause. You were serious when you said you didn't want to work with her? Absolutely. And the way I feel right now, I'll finish the book I owe you. But that's it. I'm off to find a new publisher. I understand your feelings right now, Matt. But is it fair to penalize the entire company for the actions of one well-meaning but misguided employee? Find me a new editor. A man this time. The next call I got was from Ted Waring himself. Matt, Justin, and Sylvia told me what happened. I apologize that Sylvia's actions may have embarrassed you. Why don't you and I meet you for lunch? I'll bring Marty Silvers. He's our best editor, and I think you'll like him. My lunch with Ted Waring and Martin, Marty Silvers, went well. Ted, of course, knew about my background. And rather than waste time retelling it, Marty and I met in his office to bring him up to speed. He and I were walking down the hallway toward his office when I saw Sylvia heading toward us. When she saw me, she immediately turned and walked the other way. The next morning, I flew back to Kew West. At some point, I realized that I hadn't had the one for a very long time and decided to do something about it. Two nights later, I had the opportunity to do a little bit about it, but I turned it down at the last minute. Thoughts of Julie continued to swirl around in my head. I finished the manuscript and took it to Marty in New York. I hung around there for a couple days, waiting for the official verdict. When it came, it wasn't very good. You've published five books. The first one was pretty good, and each of the subsequent ones after that got better. But this one? This manuscript is dark, dull, and almost unreadable. You'll lose 80% of your reader base if we publish this. I just stared at him. I agree. Well, rewrite it then. He tossed it across the table to me. This time, spend less time feeling sorry for yourself. Later that night, I was sitting in a grocery store on the same street as the hotel. The television was on for the local news. A picture of Julia's uncle appeared on the screen. With him were his wife and a radiant Julie with an infant in her arms. Former Governor Anthony Amato announced today that he was running for the United States Senate. His term expired two years ago. With him, when he announced, it were his wife Anne, his niece Julie Painter, and her son. Her son? Her son? That meant he was my son. Unless, of course, she was doing it with someone else. Maybe I should call her and ask her. I could envision that conversation. Hey, Julie, it's Matt, your son. Is he my son, or is he someone else you may have made love to? To be continued.